Good morning, everyone. I'm Margaret Pickett. I'm an elder at Winchester Baptist Church, and I am delighted to welcome you to our service today, whether you are a regular or not. Taking part today are musicians leading us in worship, Lois, who will be reading from the Bible, Ellie, who will be doing an all-age talk, Carol will be leading us in prayer, and our minister Marcus will be speaking on lockdown moments, Joseph the Dreamer. Afterwards, members are invited to Zoom for coffee and chat at 11 o'clock, and this time will include communion, which we are now going to be having twice a month. We trust that each one of you will enjoy and be encouraged by our service, but we are going to start with a moment of quiet and a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are able to worship you together during these difficult days. Thank you that you know exactly how each one of us is affected during this time. We pray that during this service, we will experience your presence with us, that we will be encouraged by what we hear, and that you will bless each one of us today and during the week ahead. Amen.
tell my daddy because he lets me walk the dog sometimes. My dad's called Alec Martin. He's now 87 years old. Um, he's Irish and he has a bottomless pit of really awful jokes, uh, which he's been telling me for the past 58 years and which I still can't help but laugh at. And I love him lots. Uh, okay. I love dad because he teaches me about life skills and the world. I love all the cooking he does for us. And I love his wonderful sense of humour. I feel like we did that really well. One thing I love about my dad is the fact that he is like having a personal toolkit and that he's always around to help me fix stuff when I break it. We love our daddy because he cares for us and plays football with us. So I'd just like to say amazing fantastic happy Father's Day to my lovely dad. Thank you for looking after me. He's very generous, especially with his time, and he'll always eat all the food I don't like off my plate or my out, so I don't look bad. I love my dad's patience and his ability to let things go and move on. I love my daddy because he lets me help him make some nice meals together. Hello, my name is Ellie Stewart and I'm the children's worker at Winchester Baptist Church. Weren't those videos we've just seen lovely? I expect for a lot of us this year, Father's Day is looking a little bit different. Instead of family meals and hugs, it's Zoom calls and social distant visits in gardens. When you hear the word father, the majority will think of this definition, that a father is a man who has had a child. But the de dictionary gives us several other different different definitions for the word father. The first of these is that a father is someone who begins something. Another definition is that a father can be a city leader. And finally, a father can be an older man. There are a few characters in the Bible that fit these other definitions of fathers. The first one is a man named Paul. Now, he was like a father to a young man called Timothy. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about Timothy's actual father. The only thing about his family we know is that his grandma was called Eunice and his mum was called Lois. Now, we know that these two women taught Timothy all about God and how to love him. And because of them, Timothy loved God. Now, Paul wrote letters to Timothy, teaching him lots of other things about God, especially that you can never be too young to do the things that God want you to do. Another character in the Bible who fits one of these definitions of what a father can be is a man called Eli. He was a city leader. He was a priest and he was a, like a father to a young boy called Samuel. Now Eli taught Samuel how to hear from God and because Samuel knew how to listen to God and hear his voice, he grew up to be a great man of God and did some amazing things. Like the people we saw in the video earlier, we should all be thankful for our dads and those that have been like dads to us. That's what today is all about. But no matter what our real dad is like, we all have one father who promises to always be with us. God is our heavenly father. He will never mess up. He will never leave us and never make a mistake. In Psalm 68 verse 5, 
it says that God would be a father to those that don't have one. Isn't that wonderful? There are some words that people in the Bible used when they prayed to God. They would say, Abba, Father. Do you know what those words really mean? They mean Daddy God, that God is our perfect Father. We can completely trust in him. He wants us to talk to him like you would with a dad or a good friend here on earth. So today we say thank you to our fathers, but let us also remember to say thank you to God for being our heavenly father and loving us too. surrender. I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams. I'm laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride. For the promise of new life And I I surrender All you All to you And I I surrender All you All to you singing you this song I'm waiting at the cross and all the world goes here I count it all as loss for the sake of knowing you the glory of your name and all this lasting joy in sharing in your pain and I I surrender all you, all to you, and I, I surrender all to you, all to you, and I, I surrender all to you. Good morning, I'm Lois Gravely and I'm bringing you today's reading. This is the story of Joseph, which we will find in Genesis chapter 37. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his, of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loves Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. 
Suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered round and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, So you think you'll be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him, all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that? he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers went to pasture their father's flocks at Setchum. When they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, Your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Setchum. Get ready and I will send you to them. I am ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting on, Jacob said. Then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph travelled to Setchum from their home in the valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for? he asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they're pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told them. They have moved on from here, but I heard them say, let's go on to Dotham. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dotham and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognised him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without us laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and they threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty and there was no water in it. Then, just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and they saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm and aromatic resin from Galeed down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain by killing our brother? His blood would just give us a guilty conscience. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented the boy is gone what will I do now then the brothers killed a young goat and dipped Joseph's robe in its blood they sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message look at what we found doesn't this robe belong to your son their father recognized it immediately yes he said it's my son's robe a wild animal must have eaten him Joseph has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap. He mourned deeply for his son for a long time. His family all tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will go to my grave, mourning for my son, he would say, and then he would weep. Meanwhile, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt, where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. This is the word of the Lord.
Good morning. My name is Carol Bailey and I am the Seniors Worker here at Winchester Baptist Church. Welcome to this time of intercessory prayer. I've taken the thread from our reading today on Joseph's relationship with his brothers. I'll be bringing some prayers and then leaving a pause and a space for you to add your own before I conclude that section. So let's pray this morning as we pray for justice in our world. Bringer of justice, hear the cry of those who suffer under heartless political oppression, those who languish in prisons, untried or falsely condemned. Hear the cry of those whose bodies are shattered or whose minds are unhinged by torture or deprivation. And here I'll pause for you to pray. Lord, meet those in their anguish and despair and kindle in them the light of hope that they might find rest in your love, healing in your compassion and faith in your mercy. Amen. God, our rescuer, the God of liberation, we pray for countries that need to be vindicated. We pray for people suffering from famine, that they would be fed. We pray for groups who need to be rescued from afflictions or abuses around the world and in our neighbourhood. Please pray your own prayers. For each of these oppressed circumstances, Lord, we pray for your release. Amen. We pray now for our land, the oppressed, and us, me. Look with pity, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, terror, disease, and or death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these our neighbours. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land. We pray for kids who are bullied and teased. We also recognise it is not just kids that this happens to. Adults suffer the same attacks and unkindnesses too. Heal the hurts from these distortions and boundaries and turn our ears to your voice of grace, love and kindness. Make the impossible possible in our lives as we seek your will and give us the inner strength to discount and discern lies from your truth. Father, we're grateful that you hear our prayer and care for us beyond our understanding. Help us to know the truth of what you say about us and who you say we are. Please pray. O oh, most first merciful God, you are Lord of the oppressed, and you are also my Lord. Grant us the courage to be brave and courageous, as Jesus was when he walked this earth, and yet kind and compassionate at the same time. 
May we always remember to love you and others above all. Amen. You care about everything we care about. And on Father's Day, we honour those we call Father, where this is due. Thank you for the times when our fathers have made us feel special, safe and important. That they were someone we could call upon whenever we needed help, who would lend a hand, give us a lift or whatever else was needed. Thank you for them, Lord. And Lord, I lift up those who are hurting this Father's Day. If they have lost their earthly fathers, I pray your Holy Spirit would comfort them, for you are the God of all comfort. If they have lost a child, I pray you wrap your arms around them and hold them. And Lord, if they didn't have a father, would you continue to work in their lives and fill that void? You watch over them and understand their loss. Lord, if they've been abused by their father, I pray that you would heal their hurts, for you are the God who heals. I also pray that you would help them so they don't harbour bitterness and that one day they can reach a place where they can forgive their fathers. God, you are loving and kind, and you promise that you will work all things together for good. Please bring your prayers now. Thank you for being our Father. Amen. And we pray for ourselves. For us too, Lord, we ask that you would capture our thoughts, opinions and actions. Jesus, you are our deliverer and salvation is found in your sacrifice. Please deliver us from the past where we have taken the wrong decision, where what has distracted us has hurt others and where our perspective has been off. Please pray. Forgive us where we have failed you and others and restore us into close fellowship with you and them. Amen. I'm going to close with a lovely prayer that I have found on the internet. Almighty God, cover my mind with the helmet of your salvation. Remind me constantly that I am your child and the enemy can't mess with me. Fill my thoughts, Lord Jesus, on what is true, honourable, right, pure, lovely and admirable. Help me to think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise so your peace will guard my mind. Don't let me copy the behaviour and customs of this world, but transform me into a new person by changing the way I think. Then I will learn to recognise your will for me, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Saturate my mind with your truth, so I am convinced that the answers are found in the word and not out in the world. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Marcus Dickinson. I'm the minister here at Winchester Baptist Church. Um, and just so you know, this is the second recording of this sermon. I've just previously done it, but it was on mute all the way through. That was a cracking sermon. Um, this one, probably not going to be as good, to be honest with you. There you go. Uh, but welcome. It's great to be with you this morning. Um, it shows we're only human. We all make mistakes and we're all getting used to doing these kind of things. Uh, was trialling out a new microphone, did the whole sermon without actually turning the microphone on. So there we go. You live and you learn. But welcome. Did you sleep well last night? Did you dream at all? We've probably all had vivid dreams some point throughout our lives. I remember as a young boy dreaming about a skateboard. I'd always wanted a skateboard. And in this dream, I'd taken my skateboard out, had a great time with it, come home, put it away, ready for the next day. And the dream seemed so real that the next morning I got up and I went to the place where in the dream I'd left my skateboard. And I truly thought I would find it. It seemed so real. And I was bitterly disappointed to find out that it wasn't real. Um, other dreams have been just as memorable, uh, sometimes just as disappointing. Other dreams have been memorable and I've been really glad that they haven't been realised. And I'm sure that's the same for you. Um, last week, two people spoke to me about dreams that they'd had about our church fellowship. The first one that was that our church fellowship was called to a week of prayer to seek God's guidance. Um, a week of prayer online using Zoom and, and Facebook and engaging with each other uh, socially distanced to discern and to continue asking God what kind of church are we to be post lockdown to continue that journey we started back in January where we said if we could only do five things and, and to keep asking God what are you calling us to right now the second dream was one where God was saying to our church fellowship uh, the message for our church was shout a little louder for those without a voice and the person who had the dream saw God placing on the palms and across the mouths of all our church family um, plasters. And on each plaster was written the word voice, um, meaning that our actions and our words were to be a voice for those who have no voice, to shout a little louder in word and deed for those without a voice. Big dreams, lots of possibilities, but what will we do with them? Well, we're going to come back to those two dreams a little later on. But this morning, as we continue in our lockdown moments series of sermons, uh, whereby we're looking at biblical characters who've had to adapt their lives to some significant changes, we come to the person of Joseph, Joseph the dreamer. Joseph had a colourful life as well as a colourful coat. Um, talking of colourful coats, I couldn't do a sermon on Joseph without donning this beautiful, colourful, multicoloured waistcoat that many of you crocheted for me. Now, Joseph got his from his father because he was his father's favorite. So thank you, thank you. Uh, Joseph's story is amazing. Um, the, the amount of changes that he had to go through as a character throughout his life, they're quite remarkable. But even more remarkable is that at the end of his story, he comes out as a character who was able to forgive those who hurt him the most, despite everything he faced and went through. And it all starts with his family. Joseph was the youngest of 12 brothers. His father was Jacob. Jacob, the wheeler and dealer of Genesis. Jacob, who tricked his own brother out of his inheritance uh, and who was in turn tricked by his uncle Laban into marrying Leah instead of Rachel. And uh, you know that story where he wakes up the next morning and oh, it's Leah, not Rachel, as if Jacob never knew. Um, in the end, Jacob marries Leah and Rachel has children by Leah, children by Rachel, children by Leah's maidservant, and children by Rachel's maidservants, and he gets his own back on his uncle Laban. It's that Jacob who is the father of Joseph. Whoever said that biblical families had their stuff together, yeah? Not really. In the reading we heard, we discover that Joseph, the youngest, was Jacob's favourite child. And you can bet if we've been told that, Joseph's brothers knew he was their, fa their father's favourite. Uh, Jacob gave jo Joseph uh, a coat of many, a robe of many colours. He didn't give it to any of his other sons. Um, not even the eldest for whom inheritance and favouritism would have been the social norm. But Jacob, it seems, has learnt little from his own sibling rivalry. And now Joseph, his favourite, will unwittingly taste the outcome of his 11 brothers' jealousy at being relegated by their father. The whole story of Joseph is an epic story with so much detail. If you're not familiar with Joseph's story, I 
highly recommend that you take some time in this coming week. It's in Genesis from chapter 37 all the way through to the end, chapter 50. It's a long story, but it's worth a read. Look at all that he faced throughout his lifetime. Uh, we're told so much detail about Joseph in those chapters. His relationship with his father and his brothers, his adventures in the desert, how his brothers sold him into slavery, age 17, how one brother wanted to save him, um, his ups and downs in Egypt, his waiting on God, and how by age 30 he becomes prince of Egypt. The story has almost too much detail in to focus in on any one thing, at least some of the previous stories that lead up to Genesis 37. Uh, you can focus in on one main point for each of the characters. You have Abraham with his uh, struggle with God. You have uh, Isaac, his struggle with his father who takes him as a sacrifice. You have Jacob and his struggles with Esau, his brother. But Joseph has so much going on, it's almost hard to keep our focus. Do we look at his father's favoritism, his father's sadness, his brother's malice, Potiphar's hospitality, the yearnings and the frustration of Potiphar's wife and the subsequent fallout for Joseph, the time spent in jail, Pharaoh's candor, or Joseph's success? There's just so much in this story. But there are parallels in the story of Joseph for today's world, I think, um, engaging with dis dysfunctional family issues. If you ever thought, or oh, we have this temptation to look back with rose-tinted glasses, thinking, you know, oh, we need to go back to good old biblical morals and family morals. Well, they were dysfunctional families. Abraham was a dysfunctional family. Arguments in tents. If you've ever had an argument in a tent, the whole campsite gets to hear it. Jacob and his brother, Jacob and his sons. It is all a dysfunctional family. Uh, but there are other connections with today's world. Does it not ring uh, true for today? A poor immigrant who becomes a huge success in his adopted country. Or a refugee without friends or connections who builds an astounding political career for himself. Uh, doesn't that ring true for today? A servant turned activist who changes the socio-economic policies of a nation. A slave turned prince. This story of Joseph has something for every time and every place. But there is one thread running throughout this epic story that stood out to me as I revisited the whole story of Joseph. And I think it's to do with a learning curve that runs through Joseph's story. What happened to Joseph might be described by some as the perfect storm, whereby a build up, there's a build-up of circumstances that lead to a decisive moment. And that's what happens with Joseph, that decisive moment for his brothers when they decide, we've had enough, we're getting rid of him. Joseph's problems started with his father's favoritism, whereby his brothers hated him. At this point, it is not Joseph's fault. He's done nothing wrong. He didn't ask for his father's favoritism. Jacob is at fault for displaying favoritism to one of his sons. Uh, but instead of Joseph's older brothers aiming their frustrations at their father for what we might call poor parenting skills, they aim their frustrations at Joseph, the object of their father's affection. That's the first nail in Joseph's coffin, really. The second nail, so to speak, was his sharing his dreams with his brothers. His first dream spoke of how his brothers would come and bow down before him. They already hated him before he shared that dream. Now that hatred grows. Now, maybe Joseph wasn't the sharpest tool in the sibling box, although that's highly unlikely given his later achievements in life. Or maybe he was playing up to the annoying little brother, the one who lapped up the favoritism by sharing these dreams with his brothers. Some of the Jewish Midrash, which is uh, rabbinical writings that illuminate what they call the gaps in between scripture. So they, they fill out the characters for us. What kind of character was Joseph? Well, some of the Midrash, speaks of Joseph as being someone who loved being the favourite, who was aware of his good looks and paraded his beautiful clothes for all to see. Someone who revelled in his own vanity and cared not what others thought of him, let alone how or what he said to other people. This Joseph, if that is truly who he was, had much to learn about himself and about God. If this was true of Joseph, then maybe we can understand why he was Jacob's favourite, because Jacob was no uh, shrinking violet. But if this was true of Joseph, we can really understand why he was not liked by his brothers. 
But despite that growing hatred from his brothers, Joseph proceeds to tell them yet another dream, where this time it's not only his brothers but that bow down before him, but his parents also. And even Jacob reprimands Joseph for this. Um, but we're told that while his brother's hatred and jealousy grew, Jacob kept these things in mind. A Jacob who himself knew something of dreams and visions may well have had the presence of mind to think, hang on a moment, maybe God is in this. Joseph's dreams and his telling thereof were the catalyst that led to his brothers plotting his downfall. The rest of the story many of us know. His brothers plot to kill him, but in a twist of irony, the eldest brother who had the most to lose out of this favouritism to Joseph doesn't want to see him killed. He wants to try and rescue him. Another brother has second thoughts as well and says, let's sell him into slavery rather than kill him. It seems the brothers were competing with one another with all these ideas on what to do for Joseph. And again, that gives you a glimpse into a dysfunctional family. Uh, but at the end of the day, they all agree that they will get rid of Joseph, go back home, lie to their father and say, Joseph has been killed by wild animals. And they tear up his coat of many colors and they douse it in animal blood. And Jacob is tricked into thinking, that Joseph has been killed out in the wild. So Jacob is mourning the apparent loss of his youngest and favorite son. But meanwhile, in Egypt, we're told that Joseph is being bought by someone called Potiphar, an official for Pharaoh, and is put to work as part of Potiphar's household. We're also told that Joseph enjoyed God's favor. God was with him in the work that he did in Potiphar's household, and everything he did succeeded, so much so that even Potiphar recognized divine blessing upon this slave and elevated him to being in charge of his whole household. No small task, particularly for a foreign slave who's been bought. Now at this point, some might say, well, Jacob was right to favor Joseph because obviously he has God's favor upon him. Um, however, I suspect that God being with Joseph in Egypt has nothing to do with unfair favoritism, but rather more to do with God being for those who are marginalized and oppressed. Uh, Joseph, however, must have thought this is his lucky break as all that he touches turns to gold and successful um, until, of course, he catches the eye of Potiphar's wife. But even as Joseph tried to do the right thing there, he fell foul yet again of someone else's jealousy and perhaps hurt pride. And he ends up in an Egyptian prison. Joseph, the apple of his father's eye, ends up sold into slavery. Joseph, the successful household manager of Potiphar, ends up in jail. Whatever will happen next. But it is this time in prison, a time when God still blesses all that Joseph does, that gives us uh, or sheds some light for us on his association with dreams. Remember, as a young boy, 17 and younger, he had dreams that his family would come and bow down before him. Now, because we know the full story, we know what those dreams meant and we know how they will be fulfilled. But if we were hearing or reading this story for the first time, we might start to ask questions about this link between Joseph and dreams. Because while he's in prison, two other prisoners have dreams that disturb them and Joseph notices that they're disturbed and says to them, what's the matter? And they tell him, we've had these dreams. And Joseph turns to them and says something interesting. Do not interpretations belong to God? Now tell me your dreams. A clear indication that Joseph is confident that God will show him the meaning of these dreams. It would seem that Joseph not only was one who had dreams from God, but perhaps had the gift of interpretation of those dreams. Now, if Joseph had the gift of interpreting dreams, then when he shared those dreams with his brothers and with his father as a young boy, he knew what he was telling them. He knew that one day they would come and bow down to him. Uh, and maybe he liked that knowledge. Maybe he liked that image of them coming to him and him being the big brother, so to speak, despite his age. Um, I suspect that Joseph, uh, whilst being put at a disadvantage by his father's favouritism, did perhaps like his role of favourite a little too much and revelled in telling those dreams to his brothers and his father. But it would seem that the Joseph we now see in Egypt is gaining wisdom. For in prison he gives acknowledgement to God and seeks to help others and rather than just elevate himself. He acknowledges that it is God alone who can interpret and give the meaning for dreams. Uh, and he asks the cupbearer, one of the two prisoners who'd had dreams, to, to plead his own case before Pharaoh upon his release, because the cupbearer is released, finds favor in Pharaoh's sight again. But sadly, the cupbearer forgets all about Joseph for two years. And it's not until 
Pharaoh himself has need of dreams being interpreted that Joseph is called upon. And now there's this great moment. Will Joseph's growing wisdom prevail? Will he acknowledge before the supreme leader of Egypt that it is God alone who can give the interpretation and the meaning of dreams? Or will he, in the footsteps of his own father, grasp greatness for himself? Well, Joseph witnesses to Pharaoh about God's power alone to show the meaning of dreams. And Joseph's lockdown moment is broken. He uses the God-given gifts in a way that elevates God above himself. More than that though, as the story unfolds even further and as Joseph is reunited with his family, he eventually realizes that the dreams of his younger days were never really about him lording it over his brothers and his father, but about being in a position to help and to offer safe refuge from starvation. And not just for him and his family, but for countless thousands of other people. Sometimes, we may misuse the gifts that God has given us, knowingly, unknowingly. It happens. We are, after all, only human. I wonder if Joseph's gift of dreams and interpretation were too much for him as a younger, favoured son. And thus he saw them as being all about himself. And this landed him in even more trouble with his siblings, more than his father had already placed him in by highlighting him as a favourite. It was only as Joseph experienced life's difficulties, that his wisdom and understanding grew and he realised that perhaps life was about more than just what he could do and what he could achieve, but more about what he could achieve for other people. When God-given gifts are put to use in the right way, they are never just about us. God's plans are always to draw more people in, always to look out for those most at risk, the most vulnerable, to extend the reach of his love and his care to those who are on the margins and beyond the margins. What gifts do we have that we can use to draw people in to knowing more of God's love and God's grace? Can we use our God-given gifts to help break lockdown moments for other people? Perhaps bringing freedom to those who are imprisoned because of the actions of others. And not just physical imprisonment, although that may be one calling, but spiritual imprisonment, mental imprisonment, social imprisonment. Who are the people without a voice in our society? Who are the people who need the work of our hands and the sounds of our mouths to be their voice and their actions? I want to suggest that as a church fellowship, we do call a week of prayer for our church and that we do meet online to pray and engage and discern what God is asking of us at this time and to continue um, that which we started at the beginning of the year. What kind of church is God calling us to be? And as part of that, we'll be sharing with you a new proposal for our church vision statement. Um, we can use that as we, we enter into prayer and as we discern what God is asking of us. And I suggest that we take seriously the image of our hands and our mouths being put to use for the benefit of other people, to shout and to act a little louder for those who are without a voice. Something we need to bear in mind is that sometimes our dreams for life do not always work out the way that we first thought they might. 17-year-old Joseph seemed to like the idea of his brothers and his parents bowing down before him. But the reality that got him to that position, I bet, was very different than what he had in his own mind. There's not a chance that 17-year-old Joseph thought to himself, what I need is to be sold into slavery. What I need is to be a slave in a foreign country, to be accused of something I didn't do, to spend some years in prison for something I've never done. Very different. Sometimes the dreams that God give us look very different when realised than they do in our own minds. And I want to ask this question. Are we prepared for the difficult times that allow those dreams to turn into reality? May God give us the courage and the strength to face those difficulties so that those dreams he's given us can become a reality in the way that God wants them. And may he also forgive us for the times when our dreams have been all about us instead of about him. May we learn to transform our dreams into things that glorify God and enlarge his kingdom and allow us to be a voice for those without. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for joining us online for our service today. Uh, join us again this time next week, 10 o'clock here on Facebook with our, our premiere video, also on YouTube. Um, just a reminder for church family, those on our email list, uh, we're meeting for communion via Zoom when this finishes, so 11 o'clock. Uh, don't forget your bread and your wine or bread and juice, whatever you're gonna use. We'll have a time of communion together and catching up with one another. Um, but a blessing for all of you, wherever you're tuning in this morning. Um, may your dreams enlarge God's kingdom. May your actions build up and benefit other people. May your voices be lifted in praise of God and in protection of others. And may God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.